Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hello, it's great to be back with John Mariani, the virtual gourmet, and uh, my good partner, John Cohen. How are you doing, John? John? Good, John, John. good. John Mariani, thanks for joining us again. A uh, pleasure. Hey, John, um, you have been a food and travel writer for, what, close to 40 years, mm -hmm. and you not only are an excellent writer and an expert in food and travel, but you know everybody in the business, as it were. I, I've noticed from your blogs, you know all the winemakers, you know the chefs, uh, but you also know the writers, the food writers. And I, I wanted to ask you, because you have your own way of doing things, has food writing um, and, and, let's say, restaurant reviews, things like that, has that changed recently? Yeah, very, very much so for various reasons. First of all, COVID has to come into every conversation. There hasn't been any restaurant reviewing for the past year anywhere. So that's just because the restaurants haven't been open. Um, and I do think in the future, and this is going to be kind of my mantra too, that while I was, well, I was always writing about places I liked. I never reviewed restaurants and slammed them. As a matter of fact, if I really didn't like it at all, I wouldn't write about it at all. Um, even when I was a weekly reviewer, which I did for the New York Times and Q Magazine and on other places. Um, that was kind of what, what we all believe, that if a place is that lousy, just leave it alone, let it die of its own accord. Um, but I will say that in the future, when it gets back to my reviewing on a regular basis, I'm going to be more not more generous. I'm not going to say the roles were very, very good if they were very good. But if they're not very good at all, um, I'm not going to say, well, you know, they could really improve the roles. Uh, in other words, this is a this is a, an industry that has been so hard hit that they cannot be uh, further knocked down and they need every um, every bit of claps on the back that they can, can get. My wife and I did go to uh, dinner last week to a little Greek restaurant we know here locally, which was always a very nice place, but it was, oh, I mean, it was dreary. Um, there were only tables to the sides. The room looked like an, a dance floor because they took all the tables out. They had one waiter. Everybody was in masks. Um, the menu was abbreviated. The wine list was was decimated. It just wasn't the restaurant that it was a year ago. I hope and think and sure it will be again, but we came out of that feeling the food wasn't very good. The atmosphere was terrible. Um, so uh, this past year has made uh, enormous uh, difference because there just isn't anybody reviewing restaurants at all. What uh, some of them have d done, like, well, here in New York, like New York Magazine um, <clears throat> and The New Yorker have been reviewing takeout food, which is perfectly legitimate, um, but I wouldn't want to be uh, the uh, owner of a restaurant who is very proud of his cooking, his cuisine, and his service, and his service staff, uh, to be judged on something I took home in a paper bag and reheated in a microwave. So that's, a, that's one big difference. Well, the, the other thing is, of course, that because of COVID, um, the media in general has jumped on the bandwagon and made restaurants super spreaders. You know, I, I think over the past few months, we've heard a little bit more realistic data that uh, restaurants really aren't the big problem here. In fact, I heard one statistic that said uh, that something like 7% uh, of the spread of COVID was from uh, uh, city hall public buildings, <laughs> public, and and two percent was from restaurants, you know, and then whatever the schools are. So I think there's been a. I don't know whether it's legitimate or not, but there's been a misinformation, about you know where the problem is with spreading COVID, and I think restaurants got a, got a bad rep, maybe an unfairly bad rep. Am, am I correct? Well, my definition of disinformation is information that is purposely erroneous in order to convince you of something, usually politically speaking, 
that's what disinformation i'm feeding i'm feeding you stuff that i know is not really true what uh, as we said on other pro programs here everybody is still treading water we don't really know from week to week from month to month what's happening out there it made s certainly a lot of sense to me a year or so ago that if you put 120 people into a confined space, none of whom are wearing masks, with COVID raging through your city, and I'm sitting at a table which is literally only four inches away from my table, I think that's a super spreader probability, if not possibility. Okay. Now, in New York, we have 50% occupancy. That means I'm sitting six feet away from the next table. That doesn't bother me uh, much at all. Um, a lot of the hippest, coolest places in Los Angeles and San Francisco and Chicago are uh, community tables where you're sitting next to people you don't even know who are you know, putting their napkins down and so forth on the table. So those are unquestionably bars. I mean, there's, to sit at a bar next to somebody, um, that's a super spreader uh, event as far as I'm concerned. So they're going, you know, they went from 35, 25% to 35% to 50%. Um, I expect if things go as they are, because remember in New York, New York was the really tough last year. From March onward, they shut everything down, including every restaurant and bar. By June, they opened them up again because we were down to near zero cases. Now, that wasn't just because bars and restaurants, but it was part, it was part of the deal that... Um, and that was true in New Zealand and Australia, where they have zero cases at this point. And when they reopened and when people started to have wedding parties and when people weren't wearing masks, these big halls and, you know, the Jewish community uh, did not want to obey. Everything, that's when the thing went through the roof again. It was not just restaurants. It was a, 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 a big rooms where a lot of people are is a super spreader event. There's no question about that. Well, there you go, John. Well, I hope it's safe to go back to restaurants, increasingly more safe to go back to restaurants uh, sooner and sooner. But, yeah. but, the, but the media issues that you brought up, uh, John, uh, just I think um, uh, there's a lot of panning of the quality of uh, the food, especially from uh, better known restaurants that have that are surviving on takeaway. And quite frankly, uh, I find that to be quite disingenuous because unless you're sitting there and having a properly served meal at the right temperature uh, at the right time and whether it be you know the entree whatever comes out on time uh, it's going to be a totally different experience but quite frankly uh, some of the meals we've gotten from our favorite Italian restaurant that we picked up no they're not exactly the same ambiance and so in theory you can't say that you've had the same experience or they may even taste a bit different but quite frankly, I think it's been wonderful that, uh, A, they've been able to stay open enough to stay in business, and B, that they provide you with a quality that's totally different than what you just throw together at home most of the time. So I think, uh, to some extent, they get a bad rap. There are all sorts of reasons to go to restaurants. There's a celebratory reason. Yeah. It's your birthday, whatever, and you want to go to the big, flashy, wonderful place where the food is great and the wines are terrific and the service is good, one assumes. Then there are those who simply want to go out for a terrific meal, and it could be a local little joint or it could be a fancy restaurant. And then there are those who want to go because it's the hottest, coolest restaurant in town, and they don't know a milkshake from Shinola when it comes to what's on the plate. They just want to line around the block in order to be able to get into this restaurant. So there are all, all sorts of uh, reasons. Then there are the people who go to a restaurant every single Thursday night, eat exactly the same thing because they love that dish and it may or may not be any high quality but they love it and so there's all sorts of reasons but my quibble oh it's more than a quibble gentlemen it's much more than a quibble about <laughs> see, look, about today's food media and i say this as yes an old white-haired white man who with my colleagues there goes my young, beautiful, brown-haired wife, um, who, along with my colleagues from my age group and even a generation uh, younger than I am, uh, have been accused of being uh, biased for 
French fancy deluxe restaurants and Italian restaurants with candles and to only uh, go to bat for uh, restaurants doing exquisite food or exciting food and molecular food and the, and the, the decor and it's designed by uh, Renzo Piano. I mean, first of all, that couldn't be further from the truth about when I speak for my colleagues like Alan Richmond, who used to be at GQ, and, and um, Coleman Andrews, who used to be at Savour, and others who, first of all, we, re we really know our stuff because we've been around for a long time. So we know what good sushi is supposed to be like. We know if a bolognese sauce was not a bolognese sauce because we've been, and, and largely because in the old days we used to have expense accounts and such, we would eat it in Italy, we would eat it in Japan, we would eat French food in, in France. These days, the young generation of food writers in their 20s and 30s have not been able to do that. They do not have the wherewithal, they did not have the expense account, and their newspapers and magazines, if they exist at all, outside of the blogosphere, are not saying, you know, it'd be a very good idea if you went, uh, 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 Alan Richmond of GQ, his editor just said, you know, go to go go to Japan, see how good the food is there. He came back with an eleven thousand dollar expense account. The editor looked at him and says, That's all you spent? No, those days are long over. But the spirit is still there that how would you know good Japanese food if you hadn't been there? Well, today's media do not get to do that. And so what they generally are encouraged to do is to find the little storefronts run by a Cambodian woman and uh, her son, which has 12 tables, which are wonderful places. I've covered them all my life. Okay, Or a food truck run by a Venezuelan guy who makes only one dish, a terrific tortilla. And those are wonderful too, and I've, I've covered them also. But it's gotten to the point where because those places are cheap and because they appeal to a younger crowd who has no problem sitting at a community table with 25 other people and with noise blowing their eardrums out and with no wine list and service by guys in a t-shirt who gets the you know the cream of stung young guy who it's it's um, so these kind of ideas of the so-called white tablecloth restaurant have become anathema to a food media uh, who have not even really experienced them and don't know what not just fine dining is about, but what dining is all about, as opposed to going constantly and only to places that have very, very limited menus and uh, no wine list. And, oh, they have, they have this great Thai beer they bring in. That's all they have, you know. Um, so that bothers me. The other thing that is increasingly bothersome is the uh, uh, PC aspect. Um, about a year or so ago, Bon Appetit fired its very capable editor-in-chief because he uh, was, uh, somebody found a photograph of him from years ago at a costume party in which he, who is not Puerto Rican, was dressed up in kind of a you know, fanciful Puerto Rican stereotype outfit. Well, that was not acceptable um, for reasons that you could argue went too far or was not meaningful. Anyway, he got his butt fired. And they said that a lot of here at Bon Appetit have always been white men uh, who, who run the place and uh, white people above them at Condé Nast, who, which owns the place. We don't have enough diversity. Now, I think that's a very good argument that can be made, um, except that I can also tell you that in my 45 years, most overwhelmingly of the editors at newspapers in a food section and magazines have in fact been women no question about it so i don't think that's a really good argument uh but as for blacks and hispanics and asians that is true they have been very very underrepresented uh there are sociological uh factors for that uh, one of which is that now they're really getting into it more. There are more, many more of those people who are well-educated about food generally, and they deserve every uh, hand up 
And I think if I were running a, a magazine, um, I would not exempt myself from being the editor-in-chief, but I would certainly want to have people from those various groups adding into the mix. Because now you're, you're, you come from uh, Indonesia, right? I mean, maybe we should do a story on Indonesian food. What, what can you tell us? What has happened, though, and Bon Appetit hired, by the way, an extremely capable black woman to be their editor-in-chief. And she's full of ideas. She's highly creative. And I hope she's going to turn it into a great magazine. But they also uh, looked at their navels and beat their breast and said, not only have we committed such sins in the past, but now if we do a story on any ethnic food and we do not even use the word ethnic anymore, and we do not even use the word authentic anymore, because that's our outsiders saying this is foreign food. Well, we're not going to say it is foreign food. If we're going to do a food on the, uh, an article on the food of El Salvador or, uh, or Tijuana, it's going to be written only by a Tijuana food authority. Now, this means that Julia Child, who is not French, should never be allowed, well, she's dead now, so it doesn't matter, that she would never be allowed to write on French cuisine for these magazines. That Diana Kennedy, who is not Mexican, she's an English woman, but is considered the greatest doyen of Mexican uh, cookbooks, uh, she would never be able to write a, an article again on Mexican food. Um, there are many, uh, one of my, my, my friends here in New York, Arthur Schwartz, um, and uh, Fred Plotkin are Jewish guys who have written two of the most authoritative books on Italian cuisine that I, as an Italian-American, say is out there. I mean, they are just the authorities under these new rubrics. Oh, no, Plotkin's Jewish and Schwartz is Jewish. He's not writing about Italian food. Only an Italian. As a matter of fact, only a Sicilian is going to write about Sicilian food. And only a Tuscan is going to write about Tuscan food. I mean, this is so preposterous. But it's it's the PC lay of the land at this point, and uh, it's going to get us uh, it's going to get into a place where people are not going to read these magazines anyway. Well, I don't know why they would have to with the uh, virtual gourmet newsletter. And, Me neither. Uh, uh, really, why else would they need another resource? But you know, no accounting for taste. Well, I mean, I would if I were to re want to read an article, a travel article, on let's say Athens, I would want or the Greek islands. Do I want Zorba the Greek to write it? Well, that would be very, very interesting. Would I want one of the great Greek food writers to write it? Of course, I'd assign him in a moment. But would I also say, you know, we have travel writers on staff here who do this for a living, have been to Greece, have been to Austria, have been to Morocco. These people know how to write about travel, what to look for, um, uh, certain of go on adventures. To dismiss them as simply not coming from Oshkosh does not mean they can't write about Oshkosh. If they want to write about Oshkosh. Well, who knew that political correctness had infiltrated the food, uh, the food media? Big time. Yeah. Well. Hopefully all that will be gone in a while and we'll all in just enjoy whatever we enjoy. These things do tend to flare up very brightly in extreme forms and this, and then uh, uh, die down like uh, Cardi B performing on the Grammys. <laughs> a great cultural reference. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think to be politically correct, we ought to stop over our heads. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> John, thanks. This is... I mean, let's face it, there, are, there are libraries that want to kick everything from Tarzan to Huckleberry Finn off the library shelves, and there are others who are seriously considering taking um, a Shakespeare out of the uh, uh, out of the uh, the repertoire, out of the uh, the curriculum, because in Shakespeare you can find that's a great thing about Shakespeare. You could find anything about anybody and any subject under the sun. That's how great he was because he could write from so many different viewpoints. Well, all this too shall pass and we'll get back to the most important thing and that's good food. John, thanks again for your perspective. Always interesting. Good to be on, you guys. 
For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.